Salawat. Uh, just a reminder to those that have come, if you haven't registered in the entrance, please do so um, at some point during the program, just so that we have everyone's details for contract tracing purposes. And please uh, do wear a mask during the program. Uh, we'll start the program, inshallah, with the recitation of Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وأعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير صدق الله العلي العظيم In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful Surah Mulk, Ayahs 1-6 Blessed is the one in whose hands rests all authority, and he is most capable of everything. He is the one who created death and life in order to test which of you is best in deeds, and he is the almighty, all-forgiving. He is the one who created seven he heavens, one above the other. You will never see any imperfection in the creation of the most compassionate. So look again. Do you see any flaws? Then look again and again. Your sight will ret return frustrated and weary. And indeed, we adorned the lowest heaven with stars like lamps and made them as missiles for stoning eavesdropping devils for whom we have also prepared the tor torment of the blaze. Those who disbelieve in their Lord will suffer the punishment of hell. What an evil destination. Salwat. Um. We're privileged today uh, to be joined by uh, Sheikh Ali Reza Khaki, who will be talking to us on the ethics of mourning. Can we please welcome him with a loud salawat? <laughs> Sheikh Ali Reza Khaki has been studying Islamic studies the past few years and is involved in inter slash interfaith work and community cohesion. He graduated from the Al Mahdi Institute. He completed his postgraduate studies in Islamic studies and currently teaches the Islamic studies modules um, at the Institute. Salawat. Audhu billahi min al shaytan al rajim. Bismillahi al rahman al rahim. Wa bihi nasta'in. Wa huwa khayru nasirin wa mu'in. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi al tayyibin al tahirin. Assalamu alaikum jamia wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, um, I've chosen the topic of the ethics of mourning. And this isn't really um, telling you what to do or what not to do. Um, the aim of it is to present uh, why we do what we do and for us to introspect, to realize, to recognize why we do what we do. Uh, and really, that's the ethic. To, to have that, um, uh, you know, r recognition of uh, knowing why we do what we do. And that's the whole purpose of this. Um, now, I'll be running through a couple of uh, things um, in terms of mourning, rituals that the Shias, uh, as Shias we do, you know, the crying we have. And I won't cover all of these. We'll just touch on a few um, you know, uh, look at a bit of historical development uh, and most importantly is for us to recognize 
and to realize uh, why we are doing these things. So there is the, the recitations, the marathi, the ziyarat and dua, then there is the ma'atams and jeer, uh, plays, processions, etc. So we'll run through it very briefly. There's a lot to talk about uh, and I won't be able to cover everything. I'll just, it's a very brief uh, outline of some of these uh, morning rituals. And inshallah, the next few nights we'll look at um, uh, different aspects. So tonight we'll look at, uh, for example, Matams and Jir processions and a bit of history about them. Um, so the, the question boils down to why do we do what we do? Uh, and um, have, do we have a congruence within ourselves when we do these acts? I know as a youngster, uh, when I was uh, going to the Husseiniyas, at times I was forcing myself to do uh, certain things because of what society, what others are looking at me and, you know, uh, expecting of me. So the point is that do we have this congruence within ourselves? Are we being genuine when we do these things? Are we forcing ourselves to do these things? And we find um, at different points in time we have uh, this reflection within ourselves. Why are we doing what we do? So uh, the other thing about these presentations is that we're going to try something different. We're going to have uh, a poll um, on Slido uh, so we can uh, see the results, I think, which will come up. So the, uh, something different for Muharram. Let's see how it goes. So the first question is why do you attend the Muharram Majalis? So slido.com and the code is MORNING. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. So... I'll give it a minute. So why do you attend the Muharram Majalis? Is it to learn something? Is it um, guilt or habit or something? And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, whatever uh, is here, the, the main point is to recognize why we do what we do. Uh, expose the children to culture. I know sometimes we feel like that. To meet people, I, I do that also. Um, anything else? Yeah. There's no right or wrong answer. So we, we get this sort of 71% um, to learn something and it's uh, changing. Um, but it comes back down to this point of reflection. And sometimes we, uh, it, it boils down to the question of what religion is all about. And sometimes we get challenged on certain things. Um, when Prophet Ibrahim uh, challenges these people, uh, and uh, after he's broken all these idols, he asked these people, ask the big idol. And they are challenged at that point. Their religion, their whole framework is challenged at that point. And they recognize that what they're doing is wrong. And they had to revise. But sometimes we feel threatened by that. It comes back to, that, uh, to this point of what is religion. Is our religion such that if one piece of this deck of cards is taken, the entire thing falls down? Is that how our religion is based? If somebody questions a certain integral part, which we think is integral, and that really makes us defensive, uh, wanting to hold on to something, is that how our religion is based? And this is something which is an individual journey for all of us. I can't give you your answer. You have to discover this yourself. So what is religion and what is your religion? And there are different points in the Quran also. For example, when Musa challenges these magicians, at that point the entire belief system is challenged to the core. But they didn't react the way the people reacted to Ibrahim. They accepted this. 
They saw this is a logical way that Musa is presenting to us. And they embraced it. So this is something for us to reflect uh, in this series and in life generally. So coming back to the topic, the morning rituals. So we have the crying, for example, the visitation of the shrine, the ziyarat, the ma'atam, the plays, the processions, the self-flagellation, and in some cultures, walking on fire, putting mud on faces, etc. And the list goes on going, depending on from where to where you go, and depending on the uh, area. And these cultures are expressed in different ways. So starting off with uh, crying, for example, what is the Quranic basis principle that is used by proponents of this? So there is the Quranic verse, um, uh, 1284. The story of Yaqub. Yaqub lost his son Yusuf and he started crying. And he started crying to an extent that his eyes became white. Now, proponents of an extreme version of mourning also say, look, we are allowed to go to the extreme. But there's also the spontaneity. Uh, Yaqub cried spontaneously. He didn't do it in an organized fashion. He just cried. There are many hadith that uh, talk about crying. And I won't go into all of them. I'll just cover them. So, for example, after Ja'far's death, the Prophet cried intensely. The hadith says, فَبَكَ بُكَ أَنْ شَدِيدًا He cried intensely. It is narrated that uh, Fatima uh, used to visit كانت تزور قبر عمها حمزة كل جمعة فتصلي وتبكي عنده She used to visit uh, Hamza and cry over his grave. And there are many other narrations of the Prophet also that when Hamza was killed, his uncle, uh, he comes to his people, his family and says there's no one who's crying over Hamza. So this was a culture... And this is normal. When we lose somebody dear to us, we cry. It's a natural expression. It needs to come out. We have uh, regarding Imam Hussein, Imam Zainul Abidin, uh, whenever وَمَا وَضَعَ بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ طَعَامًا إِلَّا بَكَى عَلَى الْحُسَيْنِ Whenever food was presented to Imam Zainul Abidin, he would cry. Uh, we have uh, narrations that Imam Sadiq, uh, you know, would... Uh, encourage the crying, Imam Ridha, etc. There are all these narrations that encourage the crying over uh, Imam Hussein. Then we look at the, the actual coming together in a majalis, reciting poetry. We see Imam Sajjad, for example, when after the, the tragedy of Karbala, he comes to the, to the, uh, the vicinities of Medina and he tells a poet, go and tell the people of Medina, this is what happens. And this poet goes and he recites poetry and people start crying. Poetry was a very essential part of that culture. And it is also today. Um, we find also later on uh, in history, as time goes on, up till the 10th century, what we today call Husseiniyas, propped up in different parts of the Muslim empire, and the Shia particularly, Baghdad, uh, Cairo, Aleppo, where people used to come and Mourn. Now, in the uh, Umayyad period, it was very private, uh, closed door. Uh, in the Abbasid period, what happened was they, they had to present this um, as though they were giving patronage to the Shias. So they allowed this. So there, there is uh, this development until Mutawakkil al-Abbasi who tries and prevents uh, the Zuwar to go uh, to Imam Hussein's a shrine. So we find this uh, organized sort of gathering and the most we can get text from the text is that they used to gather and they used to cry and they used to recite poetry and there was an encouragement of recitation of poetry. If we go to Ma'atam, right, uh, we seem to see that this is uh, a pre-Arab culture that uh, when there was a death or there was something the women used to hit themselves and scratch themselves and pull their hair in fact uh, it's narrated that Imam Hussein tells Zainab do not pull your hair do not rip your uh, 
uh, top collar. That was a custom, it seemed. Um, so there was this uh, also f after Hamza died that uh, certain individuals uh, hit themselves. There was a scratching, uh, this expression of grief. Uh, and this was a cultural practice at that time. Later on, as we see in history, this uh, formal gathering of the recitation of the hitting of chest and the different expressions of it, the way it's done, for example, in the subcontinent is different to the way it's done in Iraq or Iran. So you see these expressions growing over time and taking different forms. So for example, uh, the Iranians would have this circle and they would go around and that's influenced the subcontinent. So we have these different uh, chest beating rituals. Now, I ask myself and I ask all of you, do you resonate with the practice of hitting your chest? <coughs> Again, this is for us to reflect and there isn't a right or wrong answer uh, it's for us to know where we stand individually so we see um, There is a development in time of uh, processions now. Now, we're coming to around 963, the Buyid era. There's the Buyid dynasty, which is uh, sort of uh, Iraq, southern Iran. And we see Mu'iz al-Dawla, who is the emir of uh, one of uh, the Buyid emirates. Uh, and it is narrated by Ibn Athir that on the day of Ashura, he closed, he forced people to close the bazaars, to suspend their businesses. Women would come out with their clothes torn, walking in the streets, slapping their faces and lamenting Hussein. This is 963. We see this actual formalization of a day on Ashura day where everything is closed, where people are coming out and expressing their grief. Now, uh, understandably, in that society, there were Sunnis, there were Shias, the people who identified as Sunni and Shia. So there was also this tension that would come about, where the, the Shias would come out and uh, display this, and there was some tension, as historians uh, mention. Uh, for example, Ibn Athir mentions this uh, religious fervor may have led at times to uh, potential Sunni-Shia strife. So this is processions, this is now a day that is actually taken out. Then we go on later on to uh, around uh, 1501 to 1722, the Safavids come into power. The Safavids uh, take power in modern day Iran, Persia at the time, they change the state religion uh, to Shiism. And at this, at this point in time, uh, we see this uh, representation of the Battle of Karbala. Now plays are coming out. We have scholars coming and uh, you know, uh, encouraging people to uh, play out uh, the event of Karbala. So even till today, you go to the certain Iranian, Iraqi uh, centers, they're playing out the, the incident of Karbala. Then we have 1794 to 1925, the Qajars. Now we have uh, the Qajar uh, dynasty, and they used to encourage this again. And uh, it takes a certain uh, flavor that it would be a very big thing. The, the uh, Qajar dynasty, the, the kings would call people from all over, um, deputies, uh, you know, representatives from other dynasties, kingdoms, governments, to come and participate and see these plays. In fact, we have accounts of the it Italian ambassador to Iran uh, in around that period collecting around a thousand documents uh, about these plays, uh, which is claimed to be in the Vatican at this point in time. Iraq, uh, this then, these plays then go to Iraq in the late 18th century, Lebanon, uh, to southern, uh, there's a subcontinent, and the subcontinent had existent at that time plays. So we have a merging of cultures, it was well received, and then there's also cross-pollination. So from, 
from the subcontinent and from all these areas, they start merging. Now, an interesting point uh, in all of this is the Qizilbash. The Qizilbash, uh, 15th century Safavid uh, uh, time, they were a sort of militia used by the Safavids, a uh, mix of uh, Turkmen and uh, Christian Armenians who converted to Islam. The Qizilbash uh, were influenced by Sufi practices and at the same time there were these Armenian sort of practices coming into it. Now at this point in time uh, we see there was, uh, or rather earlier, around 1260, we have these extreme Christian groups that are taking, are undertaking practices of self-flagellation out of uh, penance or uh, out of repentance. So these Christians are then, uh, these Christian practices are then coming towards the Muslim lands, either by them coming as war captives or because there's trade between the Christian and Muslim lands. The Ottomans uh, were there and uh, there was trade between uh, the West and the Ottoman Empire, which then comes towards the sort of uh, Turk, Turkish, uh, Turkmen areas, which influences uh, these uh, groups. Now, um, of course, this also goes on to the subcontinent, um, where uh, the, the Qizilbash, for example, 18th century, are, are hired uh, by, no, not 18th century, uh, earlier than that, the Qizilbash cavalry were hired by the Amir at that time in Awaz, uh, and uh, he sought their help, and he sought their help, and uh, hence these influences come to the subcontinent. Now, early reports of cutting oneself uh, Perhaps 640 uh, is mentioned, uh, but nothing earlier than the 15th century is mentioned, uh, at least within the Shi sort of um, circles. Now the question comes, a bit of history here. The question comes, as a jurist, how does a jurist justify certain actions like this? How can the jurist uh, justify cutting oneself or hitting oneself for that matter? So we, we look at this, and I'll briefly um, uh, touch on this, is there's a principle of permissibility that anything that is absent, there is no text, the jurist would say that it's permissible. And then there is the uh, i'adham sha'irullah, the respect of the uh, religious symbols. وَمَنْ يُعَذِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوب Whoever exalts the signs of Allah, that's from the taqwa of the heart. So these are sort of principles that are used to justify, and we'll look at how this wide scope is restricted. Now we concentrate on bloodletting. How do those who justify bloodletting, and there are some scholars that justify bloodletting, how do they do it? What's their basis? So we look at the justification of bloodletting. So for example, the story of Uwais al-Qarani, where um, in the Battle of Ohad, it's narrated that the Prophet went and uh, he was fighting, he was overcome, and his teeth were broken. So Uwais al-Qarani, who was in Yemen, heard this story, he went and broke his teeth. So they justify, look, if, if this, was, this happened at the time of the Prophet, and the Prophet didn't uh, reject this, then it must be something that is permitted. Or the claim of Lady Zainab, that uh, it's mentioned in Biharul Anwar, that after, uh, when uh, Lady Zainab saw the head of her brother, فَنَطَحَتْ جَبِينَهَا بِمَقْدَمِ الْمَحْمَلِ She hit her head against the spear. So this is used as a justification. Now, both of these incidents, one can critique whether these actually happened, and there is a critique on that, that these evidences are weak. And even if we were to presume that these did happen, and they're conflicting narrations, uh, for example, Uwais al-Qarani, not, not much is spoken about this incident in the Shia literature. But let's assume, for argument's sake, that this did happen. At the end of the day, it's a spontaneous action, that it happened, and I'm not here to tell you what to do or what not to do, but for us to reflect on how this comes about. It's a spontaneous action. There was no formalized coming together and doing these things. The third, and there are many other justifications that are used by people who uh, proponents of bloodletting is, for example, in uh, Ziyarat Nahia, 
if you were to accept the authenticity of it, um, Imam Mahdi says that I will weep blood in place of tears. Now again, this is a form of expression. When you say something like that, uh, it's uh, talking about the gravity, if you are to accept the authenticity of it. And even if Imam Mahdi does this, it is not telling us to go out and do this. So this is something for us to reflect upon. This is the narration. Now how the, the, the arena is left very vast and wide because there is this principle of permissibility. When there is no text, you can do what you want. But the, the faqih now restricts it. It says there is harm. Whenever there is harm on an individual or on others, then that thing is impermissible. Or if there is a harm on the image of Islam, then that thing is impermissible. Or if that certain act leads to idolatry or shirk, then that thing is impermissible. So, as an overview, um, we have in the texts that crying majalis rooted in texts, the ma'atam rituals, it's a custom, it's something that's developed over time, it's taken some rich uh, expressions over time, and the principle of permissibility is used, similar with processions, plays, etc. What I want to outline is a few views of the ulama, the scholars on this, and just for us to reflect and see that there is a diversity of opinions on these issues, spe specifically with bloodletting. So, uh, regarding uh, someone asks Sayyid Khui about blood uh, bloodletting, he says, if it results uh, in harm, uh, then it's impermissible. Or if it results in the weakening of the faith, then it's impermissible. So this is Sayyid Khui. Sayyid Sistani, for example, asked a question early on, he says if it causes harm, then it's impermissible. Although certain reports say that uh, his latest uh, opinion is that he's silent on it, uh, just so that no one party can use his name. Sa uh, Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi, on the other hand, says it is mustahab. So we have permitted, unless harmful, we have it being mustahab. We go to the other end of the spectrum, we have Sayyid Khomeini, Khamenei, it's impermissible, it's illogical, it doesn't have any basis in religion. And we find this also, Sayyid Fadlullah, etc. He's also asked that, uh, are we allowed to do this in uh, private? Question, uh, it's answered no, even if it's in private, it's impermissible. Um, so, these, this is the spectrum of views that we have. Um, on one hand, there is permissibility. On the other hand, there is impermissibility. So this is the sort of discussion, this is the sort of uh, debate that is going on. So we've seen that all these actions have taken over history different expressions. And we have from these texts, we have from the actions of the Imams, we have from the actions or even the tacit approval of the Imams certain opinions being formed based on similar historical events, which makes us uh, reflect and see that there is diversity in coming out with different opinions, and there is diversity uh, in uh, the deduction of law. And there is, a uh, over time as we see, there is a progression and a change of expressions of religion. You see, religion is expressed in various ways. Today we express it in this way, uh, not saying that one way is right, one way is wrong, but it's for us to recognize that expressions of religion are there in different cultures, taking different forms. And sometimes when we go to other cultures, we like their expression. We go to, for example, um, Christmas Mass. We like that expression, right? We aren't used to that. We go to different areas uh, different countries, we see the same Shia Islam being expressed in different ways, all influenced by their culture, some wearing black, some wearing white. doesn't mean that one is right, one is wrong. They are all bringing about that same remembrance of Hussein. Now, the scholars recognized uh, after the 18th, 19th century, um, they recognized that the message of uh, Hussein 
uh, was one that was very powerful. Uh, 20th century, we see, for example, influencing certain political movements. For example, in Iran, one of the factors was this revolution of uh, al Hussein. So, a very powerful one. But at the same time, as we'll investigate in the other nights, at the same time, there was this exaggeration in the stories. So we find stories that exaggerate about uh, what happened in Karbala and uh, the super human abilities of the Imam or those uh, present there who were able to kill so many people in a, sh in a short period of time. We see these uh, expressions taking certain extremities. But it comes back down to that uh, question. Does it promote the message of Imam Hussein? Uh, and does it bring about communal goodness? Sometimes these expressions, and we find this in the UK also, that uh, uh, certain communities would, uh, would come and have processions and beat their chest outside. What's the purpose of that? What's it bringing about? Is it just for us to satisfy our own needs? Are we there to bring about some communal goodness? Uh, and, for example, in Birmingham, uh, we'd have this procession. So one year I went and I asked some of the shopkeepers and I said, what's going on? I acted as though I didn't know. And they said, ah, they're just hitting themselves. Why are they hitting themselves? We don't know. They're Shia. They hit themselves. So this is the perception. You go onto Google, you search Ashura or uh, Muharram or uh, uh, whatever. You see these images coming up of people cutting themselves or cutting children. Or even uh, comments online, etc. We need to ask ourselves as individuals and as communities, are we uh, propagating the morals of Imam Hussein? Are we... Uh, taking forward that message of Imam Hussein of standing up for uh, against injustice, standing up for justice. And even in our own lives, you know, we're faced with difficult situations at times where we may have to lie at instances. Um, and we ask ourselves, are we uh, in line, congruent, and it's all about that congruence with that message of Imam Hussein. And even in our practices, are we congruent we look within ourselves, do we have that congruence? Do we have that sincerity? Are we comfortable in doing what we're doing? If we are, then we've reached that position that we're supposed to. And this comes back down to that initial question in the first slide, what is religion and what is it all about? It's supposed to bring about goodness within us. We see Imam Hussein, even at that last point in time, he's talking to God. He's having a conversation with God. He's remembering what God has given him. So this is something for us to reflect upon. And uh, as we go into the Q&A, I'll ask this last question for us to reflect on. Do you think the current sh public Shia practices give a bad image of Islam and Shiism? And I'll open the door up to uh, any questions. Um, we now have some time for some question and answers. So if there is anyone on either side who would like to ask any questions, please let us know. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, briefly that some of the regulation, for example, was probably um, taken from some Christian practices. Mm. And I, I believe that even to this day, parts of Portugal or Spain, I'm not mm. sure where they do some of these things. Mm. And obviously, other things which you have said, they have been, uh, if you like, borrowed from local traditions and adapted, obviously. Mm. 
Now we've been here about 40 years, 50 years. Do you see any changes in our practice to adapt to what we are seeing around us or are we still uh, borrowing from where we came and we are not moving? Isn't, isn't this center a testament to that? Um, that we are adapting to the, the times and the different centers. So yes, there are, there are pockets of uh, adaptation. But overall, I think also because our uh, direction is for as Shias facing the Middle East, so we, we're still getting a lot of practice uh, from those areas which have been influenced by these certain practices. So certain communities, as, as uh, you may know, uh, have changed their practices over the years, uh, maybe influenced by religious edicts, uh, and have stopped certain practices. So for example, in Lebanon, we know that they've stopped uh, zanjir or cutting blood, and in, in, in place of that, um, we have the donating of blood, even in Iran. Whereas on the flip side, there are certain scholars like uh, Bashir Najafi who, who say that we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't be stopping bloodletting uh, and giving blood. We should continue these practices because they are promoting the values of uh, Imam Hussein. So I guess as a, as a Shia community, we are influenced heavily by these scholars and their opinions. And what happens is that these scholars have students who then influence their local communities. Uh, and if they have uh, influence over a community, they normally want to uh, propagate their uh, outlook. Um, so yes, to certain extent, who communities adapt to their place where they are in, but many a times they're influenced by the religious scholars who are based in primarily in the Middle East. Yeah. Do we have any more questions from either side? Um, thank you so much. Um, it, it is just like moving an elephant, isn't it? I mean, the pace at which things will change, it could be another thousand years, really. Um, and as you rightly said, the, the most powerful agents for change are our ulama, our mujtahideen. And I find it incredible that at the merger level, there's so much diversity of opinion to the extent that you say if Ayatollah Bashir Najafi proactively encourages to continue, I find it exceedingly difficult to rationalize in my own mind a scholar of that caliber coming to a deduction contrary to the other equivalent merger. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, if I were to compare that with some of the world political events, um, or even at the micro local level, it is always not s scholastic deduction, but political influences that take over for such thing. Are the merger really making a scholastic deductions only, or do you think there is the political influences? So I think to some extent there is a scholastic deduction, and in their framework they, ju they justify how they deduce their rulings. Um, a certain uh, maraja may not have that much of a political clout, uh, or may not be influenced that much politically, uh, and they come up with rulings like it's mustahab to do certain acts. But at the same time, certain there is, there is definitely an element of politics and political influence. Um, so for example, uh, certain maraja not giving an opinion just so that their name can't be used 
on either side to bash each other um, shows that there is some sort of political leverage that they want or they want to portray at least or they want so that they can do what they want to do um, one can say that they want to do good and hence they want to do that so yes there is an element of both they there is they will justify it using their framework um, but yes there is also there is always that political influence Salam, there's a question online of, through Slido, if that's okay. That's fine. So, I'm struggling to explain martyr practices to my young child. How can I explain without judgment or negativity? Also, this person feels like they're judging the martyr. Uh, well, again, yeah, this one point I forgot to mention. Um, uh, congruence uh, is that, A, we are comfortable with what we do. So we should be doing what we do, we're comfortable with that. And B, we should, we should never look down at others because of what they do. And I've been victim to that also sometimes, you know. Certain communities do lots of matam and uh, they're not following the message of Hussein. Uh, and this is my internal struggle that I have sometimes. So we shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be judging anyone based on their uh, actions. If you want to explain to uh, someone uh, certain actions uh, that you know, they want to explain the justification of that. Um, we've outlined the justification briefly. If they want them to appreciate that, they can take the children to these different centers that carry out these uh, rich cultural practices. Um, it's a very difficult question. Um, I, I, I struggle with that also. And I guess that individual needs to really uh, introspect and find out how, you know, sometimes the answer comes from within, uh, to re recognize and introspect and see how they can do it the best, and they know their child the best, and they can answer in that fashion. Thank you so much, uh, we'll end the Q&A there. Salawat. Isa luta fir na basa zhira ka gir hai kar bobla Isa luta fir na basa zhira Oh, 
हक कल मला जहरा का गे हाय कर बो बला ऐसा लूता फिर ना बसा जहरा का गे हाय कर बो बला पिछे नहीं मुझतबान ही सही पिछे नहीं मुझतबान ही मुर्तजान ही मुस्तफा नहीं हो के बेनवा क्यों न फिर बला जहरा का गिर है कर बो बला ऐसा लूता पिर ना बसा जहरा का गिर है कर बो बला सलवात Zar Hussain son of Haider we send us salam send us salam nabi allah's grandson we send us salam send us salam a man on his mission to save allah's word confrontation from tyrants that wanted the world refusing the behalf from curses eat ya imam ya hussein ya mazlum ya shaheed zar hussein zar hussein zar hussein son of haider we send us salam send us salam nabi allah's grandson we send us salam send us salam alone by the euphrates calling for aid his brothers were martyred their bodies lay slain With us sir approaching the time had arrived his sword now unsheathed the lion unleashed that Hussein that Hussein that Hussein son of Haider we send us salam send us salam Nabi Allah's grandson we send us salam send us salam his khaybar the spear from Ali Akbar's chest the three pronged arrow from Asghar's small neck for no man should witness their children's demise but alas my mom oh what choice did you have that hussein that hussein that hussein son of haider we send us salam 
send us along. Nabi Allah's grandson, we send us along. Send us along. In battle, this hero triumphed over all. But Asr was here, as was Allah's call. Their stone spears and arrows, as he falls from Zuljana, straight into such the the value of Salah that Hussein, that Hussein, that Hussein, son of Haider, we send our salams. Send us along, Nabi Allah's grandson. We send us along, send us along. His body lay headless, trampled by hoofs. The ultimate insult that Yazid approved. The widows are screaming, the tents are on fire. Whilst enemies plunder, the loot they desire. That Hussein, that Hussein, that Hussein, son of Haider, we send us salam. Send us along, Nabi Allah's grandson. We send us along, send us along. A man on his mission to save Allah's word. Confrontation from tyrants that wanted the world. Refusing the bayat from cursed Yazid. Ya Imam, Ya Hussein, Ya Madlum, Ya Shaheed. Thought. Ziyar. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Assalamu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Mawlaya ya Rasul Allah. Assalamu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Mawlaya ya Nabi Allah. Assalamu alayka ya Sayyidi ya Mawlaya ya Muhammad ibn Abdillahi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. السلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى ابن عمك أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب وصي رسول رب العالمين السلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى بضعتك الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى زوجتك الوفية الغراء خديجة الكبراء أم المؤمنين السلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى ولديك الإمامين الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب أهل الجنة السلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى أئمة المسلمين من ذرية ولدك الحسين علي السجاد ومحمد الباقر وجعفر الصادق وموسى الكاظم وعلي الرضا ومحمد الجواد وعلي الهادي والحسن العسكري والحجة ابن الحسن المهدي السلام عليك يا صاحب الزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله مخرجك وضوء وجعلنا الله من أنصارك وأعوانك والمستشهدين بين يديك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه 
في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين Brothers and sisters, just a reminder that um, our daily programs this Muharram cost around £8,000. So if you would like to kindly uh, donate towards the Muharram Front, uh, please talk to an EC member on either side or there are donation boxes at the entrances. Thank you. <laughs> 